To look after your bearded dragon successfully, you need to get this beginner's knowledge under your belt. Now, a lot of these recommendations are from how I keep my own bearded dragon, how my partner keeps her bearded dragons, and from Beardy Vet, who I interviewed on this channel, who is the world's leading expert in bearded dragons. The minimum you need to keep a bearded dragon is a 4 by 2 by 2 foot vivarium, or terrarium, or whatever you want to call it, just habitat which is the equivalent of a 120 gallon tank. Now bearded dragons get quite big, so anything less like really restricts how much they can really move. Bearded dragons hold territories hundreds of, of square meters in the wild, so giving them like four feet of space within our homes isn't really unreasonable. Now ideally you should really strive to go much bigger, because bearded dragons will really appreciate that room to run up and down, but a 4x2x2 is the minimum. Now you can put babies straight into a 4x2x2, I have no problem with that. They're not going to get like lost in a 4x2x2 space, the space they'll use in the wild is far bigger. I have worked in reptile stores for years and have always just sold them straight into a 4x2x2 as a little itty bitty baby and they've always done really well with like great success. There may be this temptation to buy like these little starter kits that are much smaller for a baby, which are too small for an adult. And the temptation's there, but really don't do it. You can buy a 4x2x2 for as little as $299 and buy the vivarium just once, rather than buying like a starter kit for $266 and then having to later buy the full $299 4x2x2 later on anyway. So it, it just isn't cost effective to do that. Just get the 4x2x2 two two straight away and then you know you've got an appropriately sized habitat for the rest of your bearded dragon's life. I know it's really tempting that you really want this dragon and you may, maybe you've saved up a little bit of money and you're like, surely this tank's big enough. Surely it's big enough because you like, we kind of convince ourselves. They're like, yeah, it'll be okay because especially if that's what our budget at this current moment will allow. But honestly, I from speaking from experience, don't do it. What ends up happening is we get the lizard and then later on we're like, yeah, he really needs that upgrade. And you're like, so you have to buy it all again and more. And you're like, uh oh, like I need to save up a little bit first to do that. And depending on like the position that might take you a short amount of time or a really long amount of time. And in the meantime, the dragon like suffers in this sort of like transitionary period rather if we just take our time and save up for all the appropriate gear for the long t term straight away, then there's no period where a, a dragon suffers. It just goes into a great home straight away. The only thing that suffers is our own impatience. And um, obviously that's better than the animal suffering. So for love of God, trust me, just get the forefoot straight away. It's better for the bearded dragon and it's certainly better for your wallet. It's a win-win. Now to heat your bearded dragon, you want a heat lamp. Now the wattage can be sometimes situational, but roughly on average people go with a 100 watt heat lamp. You want to place that at one end of the enclosure so that one spot is really hot and bright, and then the other end is like shaded and cool, like just like in nature. Beneath your heat lamp you want to place like a nice flat basking rock or log or something similar. I like to go over rock because they warm up quite nicely. It can be from anywhere, from outside, as long as you clean it appropriately, from a garden centre, from an actual dedicated pet store, just as long as your bearded dragon can comfortably sit on it to bask, it's good to go. The rock will get warm from the lamp, it'll be the perfect basking spot for your bearded dragon to bask on. Now the entire area in and around this spot underneath the bulb is what we call the basking zone. You want the basking surface temperature of this rock underneath the heat lamp to be 40 to 42 degrees Celsius or we're looking at 104 to 107 Fahrenheit. It really needs to be this hot to really get through to the Bearded Dragon's core and warm it up appropriately. The Bearded Dragon needs its core to get up to 36 degrees Celsius, which is again, 97 Fahrenheit essentially. If you can't get this rock hot enough, then you can effectively up the wattage of the bulb or decrease the distance and play around with that. And vice versa, if it's too hot, you can decrease the, uh, the wattage of the bulb and obviously increase the distance to the bulb. Just don't be sensible with it and don't let your bearded dragon get so close that it can burn itself. If you, if you place your hand there and it's too hot to keep there, it's probably too hot for the bearded dragon is a good rule of thumb. But the recommended safe distance from the heating equipment for a good basking spot is around 12 inches. Now, you don't want them to bask all day long because what that is showing you is they can't get their core body temperature up. 
What they should do naturally is in the morning, we'll go to the basking spot, get really hot and warm and warm up, and then just go about their day in the rest of the enclosure. And they might zip back and go for a little top up and a little tiny bask and warm up and go about their day. And they might do little pit stops and just like top up on temperature. But they shouldn't sit there all day long. If they sit there all day long, they're not getting energized enough and you need to like play around with your basking spot again. I would strongly recommend use a thermostat to control for the temperature of your heat lamp. It keeps the temperatures in the range that you want, but also protects you against like causing fires accidentally. So what I recommend is going and watching our guide to thermostats on this channel here. You can let the cool end go down to like the low 20s and that's fine. That's the air temperature and that'll be completely fine for it to go down to that. They might find pockets of shade in nature that will go that cool. As long as it has that basking spot and the ability to regulate itself, it will. Now you want to use thermometers to measure the air temperature and then use a temperature gun to measure the basking surface temperature of objects. The different things, everyone's familiar with uh, temperature guns now because of the pandemic and everyone measuring each other's foreheads. So one of those things, you can get them quite cheap online. That'll measure the surface temperature of the enclosure they'll nicely like optimize your nice little basking spot and then use your 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 thermometer to measure the air temperature in the cool end and as long as it can cool down and warm up appropriately in the way that i've described you're good to go but just be aware that the temperature of the air and the temperature of the surface are not the same thing that's why when you're outside, it's a really hot, sunny day. The air might be comfortable and not too bad, but if you were to touch your hand on the concrete or tarmac, it'd be really, really hot. That's the difference. They're not the one and the same, and we need to use different equipment to measure different things. But both of those are quite cheap, so you'll be all right. Now, bearded dragons need UVB to survive. It's not optional, it's a requirement. They would literally die without it. They don't have the bile acids in their gut to actually digest vitamin D orally. So they need to make it subcutaneously in their skin under UV. And they need to make enough vitamin D, one for just health, and to be able to absorb the calcium in the gut. It's the vitamin D that allows them to actually absorb it. So if there's a lack of vitamin D, it, they, it, they can eat as much as they want, but they might not absorb it from their gut properly. And that is why it's essential. Without it, they can get really sick and get like metabolic bone disease and even die. Bearded dragons in the wild have been commonly recorded basking an ultraviolet index of four. Now, if you want to get really into the technical aspects, there's like other videos you can watch on the channel. But basically, you want a nice 12% long linear UVB tube or even a 14%, depending on distance to the animal and where there's a mesh in between. It can be quite variable. So I do recommend watching that UVB guide if you have the time, because I go into the nitty gritty on how to actually choose the correct bulb for your exact situation. So go ahead and watch that video. It'd be really helpful to you. Like I say, you want that linear tube and not a coil. A coil isn't that great. Not only is the band of like where the UV is is really narrow and doesn't actually cover the whole of your bearded dragon but they can be actually quite weak and not allow them to get enough UV to go through and produce enough vitamin D like I say. You want to provide your UVB near the bearded dragon's basking lamp and honestly quite close to it so that it overlaps underneath but you want it one third to one half of the enclosure so that you've got your nice bright end and your cool shaded end for your bearded dragon to like regulate in and out of. Lastly you really want to brighten up this enclosure for them. Bearded dragons have something called the parietal eye and it's this primitive eye, third eye on top of the head and what it basically is is like a really primitive like light dosimeter and it allows them to see bright light and then darkness and that's all that third eye really does so what it does is it allows them to find the perfect basking spot in nature if an, if an area is really bright it's probably got a lot of heat and it's probably got a lot of uv as well and if it's really dark then it's probably in the shade and it can escape when it doesn't need to use these resources anymore so they're actually really good at self-regulating in that way so we want to do this for them in our homes. We want to make our little basking area on one end really, really bright. So it does really good things for the hormones and everything that they need. Luckily, you can do this quite cheaply. You can go on Amazon and find the Sansy LED spotlights. They're just simply LED spotlights that can screw into a dome or any regular E27 fitting. Or you can use long LED bars. Again, like the UV, you want it one third to one half the enclosure. So again, like the other bulbs we're using, it's clustered to one end, which is quite this nice sunny patch, but allows it to escape into the shade. To keep this really simple, you want to have the lights on for a 12 hour period and 12 hour off. Again, seasonally in the summer, you can increase the daylight to like 14 hours and you can play with it so you create like a like a cycle around the year like we do like locally you can even like mimic your local times if you want to but essentially on off 
everything off at night, everything on during the day. You can be like 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. and you can use just like an LED timer to turn all your electrics off. It's pretty easy. Like I say, at night you can turn everything off. Like like us, they need the dark for them to actually sleep properly and like at, at peace and not disturbed. But also the drop in temperature is actually really good for their immune systems. It can be quite counterintuitive that you naturally think like, oh, it's a lizard, we need to keep it warm. But no, it actually needs the cool to like do things for its hormones. And then when it basks, it like re-engages that immune system It's really good for it. So you actually want it to have that nighttime drop. The temperatures can get really low in nature in Australia. Like in the springtime, uh, nighttime temperatures can be as low as 5 degrees, which is like 41 Fahrenheit. So letting your nighttime temperatures drop into the low 60s is not even really a problem for them. You might panic because you, you, that's not intuitive to you, but trust me, it's okay. It's actually good for them. Interesting fact for you, if a bearded dragon's not basking properly during the day, one of the things that can be causing that, if it's nighttime temperatures the night before, were really high. Especially if it's for like a prolonged period, for like a week, for like really warm nighttime temperatures. They don't really feel the need to like bask in that way, to like switch everything back on, because they almost didn't get a chance to have a break and turn it off during the night. So like getting those temperatures to drop as well is actually really good for them. So like I say, turn everything off at night unless you're keeping it somewhere where the actual room it's in is actually really freezing. If that's the case, you want to kind of use a thermostat alongside like a non-light emitting heat source just to bump up the, the, the air temperatures a little bit just to keep it like okay. But for the most part, most of us aren't living in like freezing conditions. And if you're not actually freezing at night, if it's in your bedroom or something, then it's probably okay. Again, better for the health and it's better for your wallet. So let's talk about substrate. So bearded dragons evolved in areas of soils and sands, actually really highly sand. When bearded vet actually got the soils tested in the lab, it was like 97% sand. So what you can do for your bearded dragon is basically mix like topsoil to play sand and like a 50-50 mix. And you can get them from like DIY stores, garden centers. It doesn't have to be reptile branded and it can be quite cheap as well. Or you can go, you can go like straight play sand or you can go with mixed, mixing some like excavator clay in. You can be really creative with the substrate. Basically, if it allows them to have like cushioning on their joints and allows them the opportunity to dig around, then you're pretty much good to go. Again, substrate is really important for Bitter Dragon, not only because it allows them to dig and they are really, really prone to digging. They really value that. But also it's really good for their joints because you don't want them walking around on hard floors all the time. In the same way that like jogging on concrete is really bad for your knees. Because it's not the same as like naturally if we're running along like sand in like like grass and stuff. It's not like bam, bam, bam because you're running on concrete. Con um, you're running on concrete constantly. And that's the same for the Bearded Dragon, their daily life in our home. So don't use anything like carpets or tile. The carpets, because they can get their claws stuck in, they pull their claws out. And on the tile, for the same reason, it's really hard on the joints. And none of these two like allow them to dig either. So don't go for that. Go for one of the loose substrates because it's really good for them. In fact, not giving them loose substrates doesn't encourage them to like do the exercise of digging. And they can actually lose muscle tone because of it. Now, there is something called impaction. And that's when a sick bit of dragon gets its like its um gastrointestinal tract like clogged up with like bits of exoskeleton and like roughage and some substrate as well but if you're looking after them in the way that i'm teaching you so impaction won't be a problem for you but if you're still worried and or if you just really want to learn more about impaction then i have a dedicated whole video talking about the science behind it and that'll really reassure you or you just might find it interesting. So let's talk about decoration. So bearded dragons really like to hide under logs and in burrows. So what we can do in captivity in our homes is provide them with logs and like hides and stuff that they can get in, on, under or behind. They're also semi-arboreal. So what that means is a really fancy way of saying they like to climb a lot. And what they do is they really like to have these vantage points to bask in and just scan the environment from. So just make sure you provide them with some branches and the opportunity to climb a little bit. I mean, you can use hammocks and stuff, but what I find is it makes their spine sit in a really like like unnatural position um, and they can get claws cut and they're really awkward to clean. So I just recommend using like an actual branch. Now, bearded dragons don't actually like having their view blocked. So in nature, bearded dragons like to be able to see all around them. They don't like things overhead blocking their view from the sky because they want to look up for birds. That's why rather than hiding, a bearded dragon actually set out really prominent because if they spot the bird before the bird seeds it, it can leg it. In the same way, they want to see all the way around them because a the snake's coming up on them or there's any sort of predator in the environment, they can spot it and run before that 
if there's like things in the environment for other predators to hide behind and things like that, they can get caught off guard. But if they're in like a singular vantage point with like view of the land, they're much more comfortable with that. So on other variums, just make sure we provide them the space at the front of our tank for them to not only just run up and down, but they like to like see out of as well. So you want all our hides and like branches and stuff to be like towards the back of the tank or just over the front, but not impeding their ability to move and see. It's a bit of a balancing act, but you know, again, the bigger the enclosure, the easier that balancing act becomes. Right, let's talk about water and humidity. That's a big one for bearded dragons. So bearded dragons come from an arid environment, which means their access to water at times might be quite limited. But at other times, they get it really easily. So they evolved to get most of their moisture from the food they eat, from the vegetation, the flowers in the wild, but also the bugs they eat as well. It does rain in the wild and the bearded dragons will sit there and let the drops fall on the head and down towards the mouth and they'll drink from the raindrops. But also there's like puddles in the wild as well and they'll just drink from a puddle. So humidity in the wild is like really cyclical. And what I mean by that is that it will rise at night but then drop during the day because during the midday the heat obviously like just burns it off. But it returns again when obviously the sun goes down. During the middle of the day like the humidity can be as low as like 20% but at night it might go up to like 60% and go through that sort of cycle and even in a burrow it might be as high as 80% because obviously it's constantly humid in that burrow all the time so they have access to quite a lot of different microclimates and different habitat structures within their larger habitat the dragons are actually fine with humidity it's only when it's cold and wet that it's actually a problem so as long as you're allowing it to go through that cycle and the daytime like heat will just burn it off, then it's fine. So in our homes, anywhere from like 20% to 50% during the day is fine. And if it rises at night, that's okay. You don't need to panic. I see a lot of beginners on the internet being like, oh my god, my bit of dragon's humidity at night has gone to like 70%. What do I do? It's going to die. Ah, like, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. People breed them outside all year round in Florida in the high humidity and they're absolutely fine. The bearded dragons are far more hardier than people give them credit for. There is a big difference between physically just wet and just relative humidity. Like right now this room is a quite a humid room and it's sitting around 70% but everything around me is obviously bone dry. So it's in the air but it's not actually physically wet. So let's go into diet. So first thing, the thing that I will say is that bearded dragons in our homes grow way too quickly and it causes them a lot of problems because we like to overfeed them so much. A bearded dragon should naturally take two years to reach adult size and not the six months or even to a year that you see um, people say a lot in captivity. If you overfeed protein, then you can get like early onset gout and you can cause so many health problems that occur in like rapidly growing animals. And if you overfeed babies too much, it can cause things like liver failure because after have to process all that protein that's been like plowed into them. We actually don't need to feed them that much. So cost wise, <laughs> that might be like reassuring to hear that. Grow them slowly is much better for their health, your wallet, and you get to enjoy the baby phase for like far longer as well. It's like so much better to grow them slowly. So let's start with the baby. So you only want to feed them sort of like five to six prey items that are the size between their eyes. And I don't, I don't mean like total length. I mean like if, if the prey item was sort of like this way on if it's no wider than the space between their eyes that's the sort of size they can have but i'm not talking like total length being like that i'm talking that just 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 so that's clear yeah so you've done five to six protein items like sort of like every day and then like veg every day as well as that and then when they get to sort of like 30 grams you can scale that back and feed them every second day with a gap in between the trick here is to keep them lean. If you see them getting a bit podgy or fat around the midsection, then you can scale that back even further and go every third day. Or vice versa, if you see them getting a little bit skinny, then you can go back to like every day. And you, you basically do that. But you don't want to just overfeed them like constantly. Like the, the care guide saying like feed them as much as they're late in 15 minutes. That's ridiculous. That's why we get so many problems and they grow too fast. It's all about portion control. And then adults need even less. So you only want to feed like an adult, like a like a dubia roach sized item, four to five in, a, in one sitting and then do that like twice a week. Then you can feed them a veg portion around the size of the head in total length, of a total amount of a bowl, sort of like three times a week. And that's literally all they need. And then all you do is increase or decrease based on their body condition. If they're getting a little bit fat, scale it back. If they're losing a bit of weight, 
add a little bit on. When you realise how little these dragons actually need to eat, you realise why so many of them are like really fat in our homes. Like it's just people just like love too much and give too much feed because it's the it's the funniest thing to do, right? It's to feed the bearded dragon. So people overdo it and they get fat. But if you're worried about the cost of a bearded dragon, they actually need to eat far less than you than you think. So you'll save a lot of money and it's better for them. Better for the health. Better for the dragon better for your wallet. Now I recommend rotating the type of feeder insect you're using so they get a, a really balanced and varied diet. And because you're feeding so little, that means you can like you don't have to buy like cheap like mealworms. You can like change the feeding item and really give them like a really nice balanced diet. Some people end up feeding the same thing over and over and over again. And we'll get into like the nutrients when we get to supplementation. But don't feed them the same thing over and over again. Like, you know better than that. So let's talk about greens. So that I, again, like the bugs, I recommend rotating and feeding them like a balanced, varied diet of greens. Now, I'm very much a forager and weed picker. So I haven't bought a lot of like sh like shopping um, supermarket items in a while. So I'll give you a short list and we'll read them out. So you can have lambs, lettuce, romaine lettuce, endive, spring greens, kale, watercress, rocket, dandelion, plantain, sow thistle, clover, bittercress, chickweed, dead nettle, globe artichoke, snapdragon, sage, and cactus pads. And there's probably some others you might see on some guides out there that are also like green. So as long as you're like varying and changing it, it's good to go. Like I say, if you want to know more about like foraging and feeding your bearded dragon the greens for free, then I have an entire foraging guide on this channel. It's incredible. You should watch it. Before moving on from diet, for the love of God, do not feed them fruits. It causes them like bloating issues. It causes them dental issues. And what's quite scary about bearded dragons is that they don't have teeth. They just have a jaw. They've got what's called acrodont teeth. So their jaw bone is actually serrated and it acts as teeth. So once they get decay or a cavity, that's their jawbone gone. So we really want to look after their teeth. Just don't feed them fruit. They don't have it in the wild. They don't need it in our homes. People just do it because they, yeah, the bitter dragon does like the taste of it, but for its health, it doesn't, doesn't need it. Let's talk about supplements. So calcium is the main one that people think of. So calcium is needed for like healthy bone growth, neurons firing, even for like muscle fibers to contract and just like so much more. So most vertebrates need twice as much calcium in their blood as they do phosphorus and that's sort of the healthy level like the body operates at. Otherwise if we have more f phosphorus in the blood than calcium then the body pulls calcium out of our bone storage to pump it into the blood to sort out those levels again and that's fine as a short-term survival strategy but if it's prolonged that's when our bones get weaker and weaker because we're pulling more and more out and that's where you get like bone fractures and metabolic bone disease. So the reason this is so important for bearded dragons because they eat bugs. So the bugs don't have bones like us and they don't store calcium. They have the exoskeleton. So the exoskeleton is actually really high in phosphorus so that our feeder insects are really high in phosphorus and have like literally next to nothing of calcium. And that's why we use calcium powders on the bugs to make sure that twice as much calcium is going into the, the bearded dragon's body as phosphorus. And that's how we keep them really healthy. So the simple way to understand it is why do we supplement with calcium? calcium is because they need twice as much calcium as phosphorus and there's not any calcium in the bugs so we need to add calcium to the bugs and when bearded dragons are grown really fast we have lots of insect feeder insects um, they're growing really fast so their calcium requirement is even higher and it might be as high as like seven to one so again growing them slowly giving them a good amount of calcium is much better for your bearded dragon so you might think who's dusting their bugs in the wild how come they're not all dying of metabolic bone disease in the wild and that is a good question and the answer to that question is the plants they're eating in the wild are like 20 times the amount of calcium as there is phosphorus in the in the plants so their wild diets cumulatively in like total amount is far higher in calcium than phosphorus so naturally in that environment they're doing really well but in captivity we just put supplement powder calcium powder on our insects let's talk about multivitamins now in terms of like other vitamins and minerals if you're feeding a really varied diet of both the bugs and the the vegetation you don't you should really get a balanced diet anyway so it shouldn't be that much of a problem so the multivitamin is there just to come through after fill in any little gaps provide like a little safety net of like margins of error and just top up things that might have just dipped a little bit so the multivitamin powders are synthetic and quite potent and they are there is the risk of overdosing on some things that are like fat soluble that don't get excreted from the body so as long as you dust them in the same way that you would dust feeder insects and do that sort of like 
once every two weeks. That's all you need. In terms of supplementation, it can, can be as, as, as simple as that. So let's talk about estivation and brumation slash hibernation in bearded dragons. So this is one that people get a bit confused on and I can see why, but let's go through it. So in the wild, in the summer months, there's very little food. So what bearded dragons do is rather than bask, they'll go and stay in the cooler areas and just chill out in the shade. They'll bask for a little bit in the morning, wake up, warm up a little bit, but they won't be around in the heat of the day in the peak summer months. And the reason for that is, well, if there's no food around and they bask and get really, really hot, they will raise and ramp up their metabolism. But then, then they've got to a point of like, they've ramped up their metabolism, but there's no food around to maintain that. So what they do as a survival thing is they'll chill out in the shade, keep the metabolism low, and don't have like high food requirements. There's no need to get that hot because it's, it's, it's diminishing returns and it's not cost effective to do that. So in captivity, that's written into their DNA. So when we have like really warm air temperatures in the summer months and we go through our heat waves in our homes, the bitter dragons will do the same thing and kind of chill out in the in the cool end. They might bask as much and they might literally sit in the same spot for like days. They might still eat, they might not eat in captivity. And it's different than obviously in the wild. So this is estivation. This is like just chilling out in the summer months it's not the same as brumation brumation is literally just like hibernation so a top tip to, to figure out which is which if it's in the summer it's probably estivation they do not brumate in the summer they only do it in the winter there's no like flip seasons if you're in the nor nor northern hemisphere or it's not it's estivate in the summer brumate hibernate in the winter no matter where you are People get confused because they look quite similar, but the way to tell them apart is this, if your bearded dragon is lying there, immobile and active, but still awake and they're awake and their eyes are alert and just looking at you, that's estivation. Brumation and hibernation is the same thing nowadays, is when they're literally deep in sleep. So the winter can get quite cold in Australia, so that's why they hibernate. They will dig deep burrows into sand and are under logs and like hunker down down there. So it's quite insulative and stays around 15 degrees or 59 Fahrenheit in that burrow the entire winter. And they might come out on days where the it's a bit warmer out and they might bask at their entrance for a little bit and go back down. And then not come out for three weeks and come out from one day and have a little bask and go back down. So that sort of like behavior like that, it's not set in stone with like a sleep for like four months straight they'll have that little up and down behavior but that's fine but typically they aren't really eating in the winter either and then when they fully come up hibernation it's nearing the start of spring so in our homes to do this would be let them do it and what i would do is provide the same temperatures same uv same basking spot but then just decrease the day length so i would i would get to like the 15th and mid-october and then not eat not feed them at all until after this point the reason you don't want to go into hibernation with food in their stomach because if they don't warm up enough that food can rot in their tummies and obviously get them sick or even die so mid-october stop feeding and then let them go to the end of, of october and then what i would do is start changing down our day lengths so rather than the 12 hours at the end of october go to eight hours and then go to six hours and then by like december in the middle of December, we're at like four hours a day. Just enough to get them to come up a little bit, might have a little bit of us, go back down. For the most part, the air temperatures stay cooler, like naturally they would in our homes during the winter, and they should sleep when they have this up and down pattern as well. And then obviously coming into spring, we'll flip that and do the reverse and slowly increase our day lengths back up to 12. And then they'll, with the seasons as well as you increasing their day lengths, come out of brumation and go into that spring behavior again. There is so much more you can do with bearded dragons like free roaming and training, but if, for the purpose of getting these core foundational skills in as beginners, this is as far as this, this video is going to go. I have really hardcore bearded dragon videos on this channel for that, and you can browse the channel and find that. Thank you for watching. Any questions, pop them in the comments and I'll get around to answering. And if you like this type of content and you want to see more, feel free to subscribe to the channel and see all the onslaught of bearded dragon videos I'm about to produce. And I'll see you in the next video.